Hi, we're Jenny and Davis, and we are starting our second furniture business here in the Houston area. And today we are gonna share with you our most reliable sales strategy. We're gonna walk you through it step-by-step step with the example of this awesome St. Patrick's Day charcuterie board. And then as a bonus, we're also gonna show you how to decorate and assemble the St. Patrick's Day themed charcuterie board and take pictures of it for your website and portfolio using nothing but a cell phone camera. So the last couple of weeks have been record-breaking cold temperatures here in Houston. I don't know what it is, but it's been nuts. Apparently it followed us from North Dakota. I thought we could move far enough south to escape the temperatures of North Dakota, but apparently Houston is not far south enough. So to stay warm, this week we've been wearing this Guinness and Carhartt gear. Things will be a little different this St. Patrick's Day, but that won't stop us from celebrating with those closest to us. So join us in the hashtag make your own parade campaign on March 17th. We're bringing snacks. <laughs> well. Not real snacks, but virtual snacks. This campaign is sponsored by Guinness and Carhartt. They've teamed up to make custom gear for St. Patrick's Day this year. So celebrate with us by building something, marching down your own street, or using this sales strategy at your small, intimate St. Patrick's Day gatherings. Be sure to post a photo and use the hashtag MakeYourOwnParade. We can't wait to see what you guys come up with. So let's get into the sales strategy. All right guys, so this sales technique is fantastic. Literally, we've tried so many different strategies and this one has definitely worked the best, hands down. It's how we built our first woodworking business to be more profitable than our day jobs. It's literally what gave us the confidence to quit our day jobs and pursue woodworking full time. So the first step in this strategy is building something you wanna sell, which is easy enough, right? So today we're gonna walk you through this entire process step by step with the example of a charcuterie board because that's something that we wanna sell here in Houston. All right, so we're gonna build this board out of some black walnut. That's just one of our favorite woods. We're gonna bring it over to the miter saw and cut it down to about 18 inches long. You can tell that the edges are a little rough. If you don't wanna deal with kind of rougher edges, you can buy the lumber as S4S lumber from your hardwood dealer, but we're just gonna kind of mill it up ourselves. So Davis is gonna put it through the drum sander just to get the faces all nice and smooth. Again, if you didn't wanna do all this work, you can just buy S4S lumber from the hardwood dealer. All right, so now I'm gonna find the center of the board so that we know where to drill the hole in our handle. This will also help us index the rest of the jigs we use for the building process. And apparently I'm very excited for the drill press. I don't know why. All right, so here Davis is using a 3 8 inch Forstner bit to make the hole in the handle. All right, so now we're using our fancy jig that we take over to the router. The first one though is a tracing template and we use that dowel and index it with the hole we just drilled in the board. And now I'm drawing on the boundaries for where we make the cuts on our bandsaw. The handle on this jig is actually bigger than the handle of the final board. That just allows us to have a little bit more play on the bandsaw. So if we cut past the lines a little bit, it's no big deal. Then we clamp it into our router jig and take that over to the router table. Okay, so here we're using a spiral compression bit with a top bearing, or I guess a bottom bearing, depending on how you're looking at it. Anyways, that bearing just rides on the plywood at the, uh, the base of the jig, so it doesn't cut off too much material, just the right amount that we're looking for. And after that, we've got some nice smooth edges around our handle. So we're gonna pop that out of our router jig and then take it right back over to the router table and put a little bit of a round over on the edges just so it's comfortable to hold the handle and it's not poking you in the hand or anything like that. This is just some old carpet pad we like to use for sanding. It keeps things from vibrating too much and moving around. We sand this board up to 220 grit and then we're gonna finish it with our custom blend of mineral oil and beeswax. Here I'm just using a white Scotch-Brite pad. We like to use these for finishing just cause we feel like it gets the finish really deep into the grain of the wood. All right, so our board is all finished and buffed, so now it's time to take it into the laser engraver. You don't really need a laser engraver to do this part, it's just, it adds a really nice personal touch to the board or really anything else you're trying to sell. You could also use a CNC to do some sort of engraving on your board if you didn't have a laser. Um, sometimes local libraries will have equipment like this that you can use, like a CNC or a laser. So check that out if you don't have one, if you really wanna personalize something.
right, so we made a second board. We really like this one with the uh, the knot hole and the, the clover and everything, but sometimes wood grain, believe it or not, sometimes wood grain distracts from the overall image of the piece. And I think that's what happened here. So we made another one with straight grain. It doesn't distract as much from the engraving. I um, think it looks way, way better. I don't know, what's your opinion? Let us know down in the comments. This is the one we're gonna go with here for the photo shoot. So now that you've finished building the prototype that you wanna sell, it's time to stage it and get some really nice pictures for your online portfolio. For our project, that means it's time for the fun part, which is assembling our charcuterie spread. Believe it or not, your customers will actually respond better to pictures with food on the board rather than pictures of just the wood grain. They're not woodworkers. They're just people that want to have a pretty platter out when they host. Don't worry, I'll show you how to do everything. Even you can make an appetizing looking charcuterie spread. It's way easier than you think, but the best thing that you can do for yourself is to buy everything pre-made from the grocery store. So here's a few pictures of how it turned out. So here's everything you need for our St. Patrick's Day themed charcuterie board. We're putting it all on the screen so you can see everything I have out here. So the main two things to remember are one, put foods next to each other that you'd typically eat with each other. For example, I'm probably not gonna put these cookies next to my pickles because that's not very appetizing. And second, make sure you're organizing color properly. I know this is kind of an outlier because we're using a lot of green foods. Typically, I wouldn't use this much green stuff, but you wanna kind of alternate your colors just to make some interest in the look of the whole board. So the first thing you're gonna do before you start assembling your charcuterie board is pick which side is gonna be your front. Just like your house, the front probably looks nicer than the sides do, so you have to pick one angle that's gonna look the best. This here is gonna be my front because that's where we engraved the logo in. And then from there, I placed what I call all of my focal pieces. These are the things that stand up a little taller on the board and take up a lot of room. You wanna place those first and then put all the smaller things in around those. So it can be really intimidating knowing where to start. Like, do I start by putting the cheese down? Do I start by putting the meat down? What if I don't like where any of that is going? You can always fix it and tweak it at the end before you take pictures. But I like to start with a thing that like forcibly makes me put things in one spot. And what I mean by that is this dip means veggies have to go here. So I'm gonna start with my cucumbers and uh, my green pickles. There, there's our little Chicago River, all dyed green for St. Patrick's Day. Since all of these are laid out pretty neatly, I think I'm gonna put the pickles more in a, like a chaotic pile, just to break it up so not everything's set out so perfectly. All right, so now we're gonna move on to meat since we've got some cheese and veggies placed. So I'm gonna start with the salami. You're gonna treat it just like that piece of origami paper you used in elementary school. You're gonna fold these edges in and these up. So take two sides of the circle, push in and push the others up. And then you're gonna get this little folded, kind of flowery looking design. All right, I'm also gonna show you a really cool trick to make some roses out of this corned beef. To make this work, you do need to get it sliced really thin. So that deli counter that you always avoid because you don't want to talk to the lady behind the counter, ask her very nicely, can you cut this thin for me? And she will do it for you, I promise. So I'm gonna take my really thinly sliced corned beef I'm gonna fold it in half. All right, so make sure the folded edge is facing one side and you're just gonna keep rolling and rolling and then you place it down right on your board. And from the top down, it looks just like a rose. Or it's supposed to, but we're, we're working with sliced meat here, okay? Now continue placing your foods just like we talked about earlier until your board is filled and you are satisfied with the way it looks. All right guys, so this is our finished spread. This is what we're gonna take pictures of. Uh, we also went to the dollar store and picked up some decorations just to make it extra special and festive. You don't have to do that for your pictures, but because this is a holiday, we thought we'd spice it up just a little bit. All right, so now it's time for pictures. A portfolio of high quality pictures will show potential customers the quality of work that they're gonna get. Customers don't wanna see the furniture in your shop, they wanna see pictures of it staged in a home. So cell phone pictures 101. We're not gonna go super in depth, but here's a couple of things to make your pictures look really great. Turn it sideways. 
You don't want vertical pictures. You want wide, nice pictures. And second, make sure you put a lamp or something right next to where you're taking the pictures because these tiny little phone cameras need a lot of light to make the pictures look as bright as you need them to be. So don't put the lamp in the picture, but put it behind or near the object so that the light shines down onto what you're taking a picture of. Also, some cheap map board from the dollar store can make your surfaces look really nice. It makes everything look even, smooth, and uniform. You can also hold up a white piece of map board behind your whole photo scene to make it look like it was taken in a studio. Okay, so far we've built the product that we wanna sell and we've taken really great pictures for our portfolio and our website. But this next step is the most important one. You have got to get your product in people's hands. They have got to hold it and touch it and feel it. You can't just tell them about it. You can't just tell stories, show pictures. You physically gotta get people touching your product. If it's something larger that like is too heavy for them to hold, have them touch it. If it's like a table or a desk or something like that, have them over to your place and literally just let them touch it and experience it for themselves. So you might be thinking, Duh, that's so easy. Like, where's the mystery in any of this? But it's the obvious things that get overlooked and the little things that make all the difference. Seriously, the more people that touch your product, the more sales you're gonna make. So we literally just did this the other day. We had one of our friends over and just had him go through our shop and build himself a board. We even had him laser engrave their own family name into it and they loved it. And now he's telling a ton of huge players in Houston all about it. He's lived in Houston pretty close to his whole life. So he knows people that we don't know. But the fact that he came over and got to touch his own board and make it and show it off to all his friends is making a huge difference because now we're reaching people through him that we never would have reached. Because people are going to remember actually holding this charcuterie board way more than they're gonna remember me showing them a quick picture on Instagram. So when we walk into our small, intimate St. Patrick's Day gathering holding this board, people are gonna want one of their own. They're gonna wanna buy one with their name on it. So if you decide to do the same thing, be prepared to, to sell a few on the spot, take orders, uh, have your pricing structure figured out before you go so you know how much they cost. Maybe figure out a way to take payment online so it's fast and easy. Cause there's nothing worse than somebody looking at you and saying, Yes, I want to buy one, and you not being prepared to take their order. So wearing this Carhartt gear this week made me think of my childhood, believe it or not. Um, I grew up in rural Texas. I had a really thick Southern accent. I got rid of it in college, but that's a story for another time. But when I was in elementary school, every kid, you know, would show up on the playground and everybody would be bragging about their new cowboy boots or their new, their new jacket or whatever. Just imagining all these eight-year-old kids in cowboy boots and camouflage. But I mean, that was my childhood. That's that's where I grew up. But without a doubt, the biggest flex on the playground was the kid that came to school with a brand new Carhartt jacket. You know, the tan, really thick cotton material, you know, the kind of Carhartt jacket you're used to seeing. You were king of the playground if you had one of those coats. So when I was a kid, every couple of years, my dad would take me to the hardware store to get a new coat. It was one of those hardware stores where stuff was hanging from the ceilings, stuff was packed and falling falling off the shelves that had been there for decades. I mean, you could hardly walk through the aisles because there was just so much stuff in the floor and off the, you know the kind of hardware store I'm talking about. Well, there was one pole of winter coats hanging from the ceiling. And I remember every single year I saw this Carhartt jacket that I wanted so bad. It was just like the normal Carhartt jackets you see, but it was black, it wasn't tan. And I just thought that was the coolest looking jacket ever. And I always asked my dad for it and he told me that we couldn't afford it. And so I had to get something else and I never got one. But I've always looked at Carhartt products with a twinkle in my eye. And that's why I'm so proud to say that we've partnered with Carhartt and Guinness for this project. I mean, this is a dream come true for my eight year old self. And if you're Considering new workwear, I'd really like you to consider Carhartt's line of products, especially their gear in collaboration with Guinness for St. Patrick's Day this year. You won't be disappointed in the quality and you'll be supporting a great company and our channel. All right, so we hope you learned something in this video. Subscribe and follow along as we start our second woodworking business here in the Houston area. And don't forget to show us how you're making your own parade this year on March 17th. Be sure to use the hashtag MakeYourOwnParade. We'll be watching to see what you build and make, and we'll catch you on the next one. Ask me how I do it, I just stick to the plan